Testing two, three. How's that? Good? Okay. Awesome. It's the universal fix for anything electronic these days. Turn it off and turn it on again. All right, everybody stretch your hands forward, please. Father, in Jesus' name, look at the faith people have in you. God, that's what this is. It's not money. It's faith. People trusting and believing that giving to you will culminate in greater blessings than keeping the money. Lord, that's noteworthy. So, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless the faith that that represents. Open the windows of heaven, Lord, pour out blessings, and we just give you praise and thanks for it in your name. Now, Lord, we ask that you would open our minds and open our hearts to receive from your word this morning. We want to understand you better. We want to understand your word better. And so we ask you to open our mind. We want to expand. We want to expand on how we understand you, how, how, how real you are to us, and how we can serve you more and serve each other. So, Holy Spirit, speak to us and wash us with the water of your word this morning. In Jesus' name we said, amen. amen. Okay, so I just got back from California, 123 degrees in Corona. It was horribly hot. The week before that, it was 130. They were getting vapor lock in cars. I've had that before. And I... Uh, was at my, my pastor's. I, I have a PW, Pastor Wacker. I have, I, I have a PW, too. And he passed away. Uh, he had uh, heart trouble. He had... Is that a hum? Oh, thank God. Okay. More stuff. Um, he had heart trouble. He had diabetes. He had Parkinson's disease. It's a very painful end for him. Uh, uh, and, and they asked me uh, to, to say something at the funeral. Um, so I was uh, speaking, and what happens in times like this is you talk about him, and it forces you to think about yourself as well. Wilbur Wacker started seven churches during his time. Uh, actually, he pastored seven of them, but five of them he started on his own, the same way uh, we started this church. This, start, this church was originally started in a living room with a Bible study of five people uh, in Manoa and eventually grew into what we have now as, as CCI. He did that five times. Uh, Bethel Temple in Las Vegas is still running 8,000 people. Uh, the San Jose Church has 5,000 people. I mean, they're all huge churches that he set up and started. Uh, uh, after he retired from Calvary Church of the Coastlands, after which this church is named, um, George Otis... Uh, 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 asked him if he would be the chaplain for the Anastasis. The Anastasis is a cruise ship that was given to George Otis, and what his vision was was to sail around the world and offer free accommodations to weary pastors and weary missionaries that they would come on board, free food, uh, sightseeing, just relaxing in large staterooms. And he wanted somebody, he wanted a couple who would minister healing and restoration and refreshment to these weary pastors and missionaries. And Wilbur was the guy who he wanted heading up this whole thing. He had that as an offer. Lauren Cunningham, founder of YWAM, uh, wanted he and Shirley to consider doing something else, and that was to be their theological director and chaplain over all of YWAM International. Uh, there are a couple other things uh, uh, he, was, he was being asked to, to, uh, to consider after he retired from CCC, uh, which he didn't do. Uh, and looking at this body of work, you cannot help but try to measure yourself. And that depressed me. And I started, uh, uh, in the middle of all that, uh, David Godwin called. David Godwin uh, is uh, the great missionary uh, pastor uh, to Panama. He's known as the uh, Apostle of Panama. He started 32 churches in Panama alone. All of them are filled with over 1,000 people, and all of them are still going after decades. David Godwin has, uh, on three different occasions, raised the dead, uh, when he runs and has uh, 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 revivals, what he does is he goes into a town that does not know the Lord and doesn't have a church, that's what he looks for, puts up a tent, and for a week, puts flyers all around. On this date, David Godwin, Doris Godwin, we're going to be uh, having meetings. And then on that day, they just start having meetings. In two months' time, 
I've seen pictures. Don was there. Don, his, his son Don Godwin is my best friend. Um, Don has been there. And after two months, Marilyn, the rafters of the tent, and we're talking about like a circus tent, the rafters of the tent are filled with crutches and uh, uh, canes of all the people that have been healed. Uh, the last time he went to Mexico City, there were two garbage cans filled with sunglasses, dark glasses, from the people who had uh, 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 blindness problems that got healed at this service. Wheelchairs piled up on the stage. And uh, then I think about myself. And uh, then all that weeping and gnashing of teeth happens. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually difficult for me to feel any other way. I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I should give it up. Any of you guys golf? I'm a golfer. And here's what I know can happen when you golf. You can get so far behind uh, when you're golfing in a tournament or you're golfing against somebody else, so far behind, you might as well give up. I mean, honestly, you know, if you only have four holes to go and you are 30 shots back, there is not much point in competing. Now, uh, uh, I myself happen to be very good at a video game called Hot Shots. There's a whole series of golf games. And I'm so good at this game, Kuule, that uh, I would go on the international online, uh, 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 what is it called, PlayStation Online? PlayStation Network? Okay. Well, this is what I would go on. And I would start in a tournament, like 18 guys. And by the sixth hole, everybody was like <laughs> disappearing. And by the end of it, I was the only one left because nobody wanted to play me. It got so bad that if I signed up and they saw Nicolo appear on, on, on this thing, you just see all these names. <laughs> And they all wouldn't play. Because that's the way golf is. You can get so far behind compared to somebody else that there is no point in competing. And that's the way I felt. I felt like, you know what, Lord? There's no reason for me to continue doing this. I am never going to achieve this kind of stuff. Not like David. Not like Wilbur. I think about the Apostle Peter, who we have been studying. So he was on my mind. The whole foundation of the fellowship and charisma of the Catholic Church or, and the, uh, the Christian Church is all founded upon him, you know, and I'm like, it's time to give up. These people would be better off. I mean, close the church, give the money to the poor, sell it, give the money to the poor, and everybody can go to a Hope Chapel or a New Hope or, you know, some other church, and they would be better off. There's got to be more qualified guys than me. There's got to be smarter guys than me, certainly better looking guys than me. There's got to be tons of better options for them than what I'm building here and it would probably be more pleasing to you and serve the kingdom of God more if that's what I did as I compare myself to all these guys. And I pray about it, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I feel, and says, uh, shut up. And it wasn't very comforting either. And I started praying, and I started saying, you know... I kind of get it, but I don't understand how I am supposed to compare myself to these great men of God. It makes me, I told him, feel like I want to give up and stop trying. And this is what he gave me. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians. No, no, uh, turn with me to... Where do I want to go? Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And the reason I want you there is because... Oh, it all got erased. Okay. God does not measure performance. God does not measure accomplishments. accomplishments. He does not measure how much you have done. He doesn't measure how many tracks you have passed out. He does not measure how many people you have witnessed to. He doesn't measure things like that. What he measures is something called faith. This is what he wants. There are only two things we have noted in this church that God wants from you that have any value. What are they? Love and faith. Love and faith. Nothing else matters. Your money does not matter. Your time doesn't matter. Your sweat doesn't matter. 
what you give up, what you don't give up, none of this stuff makes any difference. And I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. None of these things make any difference. The only thing that matters to God is faith. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Who's there? Romans 14, 23. Who's got it? Richard? Okay, loud and clear so everybody can hear, please. Okay, now the context of what's being talked about here is this. Things that you are not supposed to do and things that you are supposed to do. And that's a microcosm of Christian life, right? Choices and decisions. Life is a series of choices and decisions. From the time you wake up until the time you go to sleep, a human being is in a constant nexus of having to make choices and decisions. And those choices and decisions have to be based on something. Now what the context of this verse says is, any decision you make, whether it's to not do something or do something, that which is not based on faith is sin. That which is not based on faith is sin. So what God is looking for in this process of life that includes this constant choice and decision, choice and decision, should I keep sitting in my chair? Should I go to the restroom? Should I go outside and try to sneak coffee? Should I have stayed home? All of those things, Hallie Ann, whether it is something you are physically doing now or just contemplating, all those things are choices and decisions. They affect your attitude. They affect where you are. They affect where you're going to be. That's your whole life, choices and decisions. Now here, Romans 14, 23 says, says when you're making those choices and de decisions, whether to do something, not do something, whether something is, this also reflects on your value system as well. Values are what's good or bad, right or wrong, appropriate or inappropriate. All those things that have to do with your value system of when you see something. Sam, when you look at something, is this a good thing or not? Is this the right thing to do or not? Is this an appropriate thing to do or not? Is this the appropriate thing to wear? Is this the appropriate thing to say? Is this a good thing to do? Is that the right decision to make? All those things that you utilize to ascertain value of anything is supposed to come from faith. Well, in order to understand that, we have to understand what faith is. So let's talk about faith. That which is not of faith is sin. Pisteos. is the word. Pisteos. This is the genitive tense. Genitive in Koine Greek is sort of like a prepositional phrase. During the break, I was actually thinking it's more like something else. But no, I'm going to stick with this. It's like a prepositional phrase. A pre prepositional phrase defines context within a statement. A pre prepositional phrase is kind of like using the word of in something. We're talking of this, or we're talking about that. For instance, um, look at me and Kavika right here. Okay? He is better than me. Yes or no? Well, it's difficult to say yes or no to that because you don't know what I'm talking about. When we're talking about education, maybe I got a slight edge. But in this case, we're talking about physical conditioning. Stand up for a minute. Okay, now this guy, he is obviously an athlete. He's heavily muscled. He's obviously in shape, especially compared to me. Okay? He's tatted up pretty nice. He's, he's got some nice ink. I mean, you know... All those things, in the context of physical capability, he is better than I am. Now, you can sit down. There, there may be areas in life that I have a slight edge on him, but nonetheless, what defines what we're talking about, what defines the context, is this prepositional phrase. 
we're talking about, in the case of me and Kavika here, physical conditioning. So in that regard, he is better. This is the genitive clause. Pisteos is genitive, which means this whole passage and verse that we're talking about is all about faith. Faith is the context. Faith is the subject. Faith is what's being talked about where he says, if you doubt, rather than having faith, anything that is not done of faith is sin. So this is a wide global context. What is faith? What is faith? How do you define faith? Well, let me show you how the Bible defines faith. And we've kind of gone over this before, but we're going to go over it again a little bit more succinctly this morning. I break it down to a simple acrostic I call hubba. So anytime I'm in trouble, I think to myself, hubba, hubba. And what that reminds me of is this. Take a look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, 17. Now, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, which is a very common verse. Most people have it memorized. It says this. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, or the word of God. Hearing, faith comes from hearing the word of God, is basically the compression. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Say that with me. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. One more time. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. If what we're talking about is faith, not something else, a decision and a choice that is based on the values of God, faith comes from hearing the word of God, not from hearing something else. If what you're hearing is your own opinion in your head when you're trying to make a decision, if the voice that you're listening to or the message that you're listening to is your own preference, your own desire, what somebody else wants, what somebody else thinks. A lot of people make decisions based on peer pressure because they're afraid of what other people think of them. That's one mess. That's one, that's one voice. Uh, they have personal desires and they have personal preferences. I like this kind of food. I like this kind of temperature. I like living here. I like living there. This is what I like seeing. This is what I like hearing. This is what I like feeling. This is what I like tasting. All of these things go into how I define whether something is going to be good, right, or appropriate or not. Because I am hearing my own voice. I'm hearing my own preference. I'm hearing the voices and preferences of other people. But faith does not come from there. Faith comes from hearing the what? The word of what? That's the important part. It's not hearing the word of mom. It's not hearing the word of pastor. It's not hearing the word of, you know, President Obama. It's hearing the word of God. Faith begins as, at its foundation hearing the Word of God. Now, for instance, let's say I was going to make you a hamburger. I'm going to make you a hamburger, and the first thing I'm going to start with, Marilyn, is a piece of red snapper. Now, here's the thing. That if, if that's... Yeah, look at him frowning at me. Huh? If that's my foundation, that's what I start with, I don't care what else I put into it. I don't care if it's on a hamburger bun. I don't care if there's hamburger pickles. I don't care if there's mayonnaise. Always use best foods. Um, ketchup, mustard, relish. It does not matter what kind of bread it's on. If I start with red snapper, it doesn't matter how I cook it. This is not going to be a hamburger. It's going to be something else. In like manner. Any decision you make, if it starts by hearing something other than the Word of God, this is not a faith. Now, what's the problem with that? That which is not a faith is what? Sin. So, what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul here is, everything we do, all our choices and all our decisions are supposed to be based upon the Word of God. And if it's not, if it's based on your own Word, if it's based on your own choice, that's not, that's not faith. In that case, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. For instance, if I give a whole ton of money to poor people so that I get a whole lot of civic awards and I get a plaque and I get called up by Neil Abercrombie and noticed in front of everybody and that's why I'm doing it, is that faith? No. 
Because I'm not basing my choice and decision on what the Word of God says. I'm basing it on what's in my head. So hearing is number one. Number two, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 says this. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations. Understand. Everybody say that word, understand. Understand. Understand the mystery of Christ that was not made known to other men and other generations, but now has been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy prophets and apostles. In other words, okay, once you hear the Word of God, you've got to understand it, but you've got to understand it God's way. Not man's way, but God's way. For instance, is God love? Does the Bible not say God is love? Yes or no? Is God love? Okay, does that mean any form of love is okay? Is it okay for a grown man to physically love on a tiny child? Male or female? But to him that's love. And the Bible says God is love. Therefore, I should be able to exercise love any way that... Here's where the problem comes. You see it, Fallon? I'm not going by what the Word of God says. I'm now going by my own understanding... And I'm coming up with my own definition of what's good, right, and appropriate. I heard the word of God, God is love, but I don't understand it. I'm not comprehending it and I'm not understanding. Which is why you have to be careful about reading the Bible and just shrugging and going, well, I think it means this. And going off and running and following it that way. Faith comes by first hearing, hearing what? And number two, understanding what God means by what he says. By what God means by what he says. How often have you been in an argument and somebody tells you, well, you were yelling at me. And you know, I wasn't yelling. Yeah, but, ready? Here it comes. Yeah, but that's what I heard. In my reality, you were yelling. In my reality, you were being abusive. In my reality, you were being mean. All you were doing was trying to make a suggestion. But in my reality, this is the way I feel. Therefore, that's the way you meant it. No. That is not good, right, or appropriate. When it comes to making our choices and decisions in life, we hear the Word of God, then we understand it God's way. Hebrews 11, 6. says this. So first, we're supposed to hear the Word of God, understand it God's way, and then Hebrews 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe. Everybody say, must believe. Must believe that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. If you want to please God, you must believe. If somebody who doesn't believe in God does something that the Bible says is good, is that pleasing to the Lord? No. Why? Because the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. You not only have to believe God exists, you have to believe His Word is correct and right. That what God says is good. That what God says is right. That what God says is appropriate. So first we hear it. Hear the word of God. Second, we come to understand it. God's way. And third, we make a choice and a decision that we're going to believe it. Belief means I hear what God says. I understand what God says. And I have now chosen and decided in my mind and my heart with an application of my will that it is good, it is right, and it's appropriate what God has said. But what completes the circuit of faith is, turn to James chapter 2, verse 26.
Here in James chapter 226, it says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds or works is dead. Faith without deeds or works is dead. To complete the circuit, to get a light to turn on, I need to plug the thing in, have a bulb in the socket, and turn the switch on. I complete all of those things, the light comes on. If I fail to do any one of those things, will the light come on? Say I have power, Fallon. Let's say I turn the switch, but there's no bulb. Is there going to be a light? No. Let's say if I turn the switch and there's a perfectly good bulb, but the thing's not plugged in, am I going to have a light? To complete the circuit, you need to do them all. When it comes to faith, you must hear the Word of God, understand it His way, believe it to be good, right, and appropriate, and then act on it. So question. At what point does belief become faith? Why is this important, son? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there has to be an aspect of faith. With, you, we have to go beyond just believing. Because I can ask a lot of people. Let, let's say we're talking about tithing. Okay? Tithing, what does that mean? Tithing means 10% of anything we get, we're supposed to give to God. Give it to the storehouse. Now, I'm the senior pastor of this church, so I get to tell you this. I don't give a rip if you give it to this church or not. The Bible says give your tithe to the storehouse. That means there's going to be a place in your life that ministers to you. You want to really, seriously, in your heart, you believe that Benny Hinn is it for you? Give it to Benny. I don't care. But you're supposed to give all 10% to some place. Okay? Now, that's what the Word of God says, and that's how God means it. So you hear it. Is it godly to, to tithe, yes or no? Amen or no? It is. Okay. Do you understand tithing is 10%? Amen? All supposed to go to one place? Amen? Do you believe that God is right and good and being appropriate when he says this thing is word? Now you've got to act on it. Because if you don't act on it, it's not faith. Now, at what point, at what point does belief become faith? At what point in your mind and in your heart does belief become faith? Okay. Take a look at Leroy. Leroy, I'm going to throw you this pen. Okay? You understand that? Okay. How many believe I can get this pen to Leroy? Okay? How many understand, have heard what I said, and understand what I'm going to do? Look at Leroy. He believes that I'm going to throw him this pen. Ready? Faith. See that? Hold, freeze. See that hand? That's when belief becomes faith. The moment that something in his head happens, and yeah, I heard it, yeah, I understand it, yeah, I believe it, and now I'm so ready to receive it, my hands are up, here it comes. Okay? That's faith to receive. That's faith. That's what's pleasing to God. That's what we need to do. Now, so to summarize, faith, which is necessary to please God, and that choice and decision that we make that is not of faith is sin against God, requires us to hear the word of God in what area of our life? Only on Sundays coming to church? All the time. So how you get up, follow me now, how you get up, how you speak to your parents, how you speak to your children, how you speak to your wife, what you do for them, how you treat your dog, how you drive on the street. Have I said anything that is not supposed to be a faith yet? How I treat those who are less fortunate than me. The attitude I have when I'm waiting in the line for Starbucks. The way I treat my boss. The way I treat my co co-workers. The way I pay my taxes. The programs I choose to watch on TV. What I say on Facebook. Whether I use profanity on Facebook or not. Whether I'm sexually suggestive on Facebook or not. Whether I am good, right, and appropriate on Facebook or not. Every choice and decision I make is supposed to be born of what? Because that which is not a faith is sin. 
My whole life is supposed to be faith. Now, how does that relate to what I opened with? Why am I bothering to talk to you about faith in the midst of my struggle in measuring myself with Peter, with Wilbur, or with David? Because all of us are measured by faith. The only thing that matters to God is how faithful we have been. I want you to turn with me. I have like two minutes. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. So you've got to flip really fast. Just like Matt, you've got to flip fast. Okay. Everybody there? No. Okay, so 2 Peter chapter 1. Starting with verse 1, this is the Apostle Peter speaking, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Whoa. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received, look carefully now, a faith as precious as ours. Coming from Simon Peter, Those who have received righteousness through Jesus Christ. Who in this room has received righteousness through Jesus Christ? Let me me, me break it down for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Say amen. Do you believe He died to pay for your sins on the cross? Say amen. Do you believe He rose again three days later? Say amen. You are now saved through the righteousness of Christ. It does not require, according to the Bible, that you attend church. It does not require you to give money. It does not require you to give service. All those things, if you want to please God, that's fine. If you want to cultivate a relationship with God, that's fine. But you don't lose your salvation when you fail to do those things. Because Romans 10, 9, 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, let me hear it. And believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead. Say amen if you do. You will be saved. That's the way salvation works. Everything else is superfluous. So are you saved like that or not? Because if you are, let me read it for you again. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. What does he mean, Richard? As precious as ours? In the King James it says, a like unto genitive prepositional phrase, alike unto faith. In the New American Standard Bible, which is the most literal translation I know, it says uh, uh, the same kind of faith as ours. Say that with me. The same kind of faith as ours. In other words, your faith is as valuable to God as ours. See, God measures faith. God measures faith, not accomplishments. God measures faith, not accomplishments. This is what pleases Him. This is what blesses Him, is love and faith. If you are giving God love and faith in your life, that is what pleases Him, and that's what blesses Him. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You want to please me? Don't. I ain't going to be sitting on no throne judging you after you die. Okay? The Apostle Peter isn't. Muhammad isn't. Allah isn't. None of those people are going to be there. Who's going to be sitting on the throne is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's the one you've got to please. And he's the one who says, it's, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You need faith. But when you have this faith in Jesus, You have a faith as precious and as valuable as theirs. How does God measure this faith? How does God measure this faith? How do I generate this kind of faith, Fallon? How do I become somebody who pleases Him? I'm going to give you a hint, and then I'm actually over time now. I'm going to give you a hint.
Jesus was in the temple, and he was watching a whole bunch of rich people come in and out. And they're all throwing huge amounts of money in the offering plate. Have you ever felt bad about how little you serve God? Like I was feeling at the beginning of this thing, that you compare yourself with, wow, these guys do this and these guys do that, and compare them. I don't do anything for God. Why should I even try? Why should I even invest myself? See, that's the danger. That's Satan's trap. He wants to get you to, he, he wants to not only get you to feel bad about yourself, but make you feel discouraged. Why should I even give a rip? Why should I even try to show up just for, you know, one or two Sundays out of every month? Why should I even try to do that? It's so little. It's so manini. It's so meaningless in the scope of all this. And there is so much in my life I've got to dedicate to God. Why should I even take a first step? In the midst of all these rich people coming in, there's this poor widow. The Bible says she throws in two mites, which are less than half a penny. And I suspect, being in the presence of all these guys that are dumping so much into the pot, that she must have been tempted to feel like, why should I bother giving? Why should I bother even going to temple and trying to do this? God is not even going to notice this tiny little bit compared to all that money. Will you concede that's a possibility that she thought felt that way? But there is the creator of the universe, God incarnate, God the Son in the body of a human man standing in that temple. And he sees this happen, and he turns to his apostles, and he says, that woman, she gave more than all the rest of them put together. Now, how can that be? They put in great amounts of money. The Bible says so. And yet, Jesus' conclusion, the one who's going to be on the throne says, she gave more than all the rest of them put together because she gave of her need, not of her abundance. She gave all she had. How does God truly measure your life? We're going to talk about that next Sunday as we continue to study to stay off faith. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, God. Thank you for ministering to us and clarifying your word. We want to live a life of faith. So, God, as we make choices and decisions as we go through life, Holy Spirit, show us how to live a life that is truly pleasing to God. We love you, Lord. We owe everything to you, and it's our desire to live a life that's pleasing to you, not out of a compulsion, not because we're afraid we're going to go to hell. We know our faith in Jesus protects us from that, but we want to show and demonstrate our devotion and our love and our passion for you. So God, show us how to do that. And I give you praise once again, Lord, for the sacrifice you made. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Thank you for coming. Somebody give the Lord a hand because he's awesome.